Okay, so it's it's one one p.m. at South African time, and we have Brenda, myself, and Dr. Wycliffe, and he's going to be presenting today on the dilemma of teaching with digital technology in developing countries, experiences, and experiences and and design teacher educators in Uganda. If, if you want to speak in the process of the presentation, please, we will have the question session towards the end. So Dr. Wycliffe will start the presentation and we want to remind you again that we'll be recording the session and you are welcome to post your questions also in the text chat area as we go along. So Mr. Wycliffe, if you are ready, we can start whilst we wait for other people to join us. Thank you very much, Mr. Wycliffe. Thank you, Raditisa. I hope um, I'm going through. Yes, we can hear um, you. I'm happy to be here with you this afternoon in Uganda, sharing with you about the topic they just uh, presented and about the dilemma of teaching with digital technologies in developing countries. This is a research that was conducted um, two years ago as part of my PhD studies, as we'll be seeing later. And it's a great honor, of course, to share it with colleagues from Africa and abroad. Uh, to start with, I'll just give a brief structure of the presentation. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly talk about who I am because this is also an opportunity for us to know each other, especially me, the presenter. And I will give a brief context of teacher education and technology use in Uganda. And of course, uh, we'll look at the aim of the study uh, that was conducted to which I am uh, sharing with you today. And then how we gathered or collected the data, what were the main findings, the implications. And then I will uh, sum up before we open up for the dialogue, uh, as Raitisa said earlier. And uh, I'm a Ugandan and right now I'm speaking from Uganda. I live and work here at Chambogo University, as you could see our logo there on the presentation. Um, originally trained as a teacher educator in the area of art, design and education technology, to which I've been also practicing. And uh, I have got chance also to travel or had education in different countries, as you can see on the slide which I think also has given me an opportunity to look at the area we are discussing today in a more broader sense. English is my second language, so I might not be so much uh, an expert, but uh, in Uganda, we have so many other languages. Wycliffe, are you there? Dr. Wycliffe, are you there? Dr. Wycliffe, are you there? Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I thought uh, perhaps it was connection, sorry. Yes. yes, I was saying that uh, of recent, I have developed interest in online learning. And it's through that that I came in contact with Emerge Africa, for which I have been doing a course in online facilitation, which has been so great and has given me an opportunity also to look at this area we are discussing today in a more broad perspective. 
First, uh, as I said, I want to give a little bit of context on our on teacher education in Uganda. Perhaps it could be the same with other countries. For us, uh, teacher education, the university I work with is in charge of overseeing the activities of teacher training in Uganda. So it places me in such a good position when we are discussing issues to do with teacher education. And um, that said, in, our, in, in Uganda, still teacher education is at different levels. As you could see from the illustration, we have teacher education at university, but also we have what we call national teachers colleges and we have the primary teachers colleges. So through all these avenues, teacher trainees attain competences to, to enable them to teach either at primary, secondary, tertiary level. So that is how our teacher education is in a way structured in Uganda. So in this study that we conducted, my focus was more on the teacher educators, not all the teachers. As you could see, we have so many categories. We have the teachers, the general teachers, we have the teacher educators, the teacher trainees, those who are learning to become teachers in secondary schools or primary schools. But my focus was on those who are educating the teacher trainees. The issue of teacher education and technology in Uganda is very, very important and vital as it is in many other countries. There, there are a lot of investments, there are a lot of policies that have been put in place by government, but we also have quite a number of donor support, people coming in to support us in terms of trying to help us embrace technology in teacher education. So some of these strategies have been ex existing for quite some time. As you could see from the presentation, Uganda has a nice city policy for education. It also has other strategic plans, but also teacher training institutions have their internal policies that guide the use or integration of technology in the education. We look at that later, if these policies, whether at national or institutional level, are effective or not. Now let me a little bit go into the problem. As I have shared with you that there are a lot of strategies put forward by the government of Uganda and other interested parties like the stakeholders in trying to ensure that we adopt the use of digital technologies in education. Studies still report an enormous number of challenges. One of which is that educators have not fully exploited technology for educational purposes. This is not only in Uganda per se, but also we see many studies in developing countries like Ghana and Kenya and Tanzania report this and also in the developed world, so to speak. There are still concerns about teachers failing to fully integrate technology for teaching purposes. But also we have seen reports, and if you have got chance to read through the paper that I also shared, or if you read it later, you also say, see many studies which are talking about this form of generic skills that are possessed by the teachers, which was quite also, which is quite reported in many studies in Africa, that teachers have these generic ICT skills rather than subject specific skills. So with that, 
we chose to get into a study to find out or to understand how teacher educators in Uganda specifically as a developing country use digital technology in teaching art and design subjects. Art being my area of specialization, I had specific interest in that. So that we can see if what we have been reading and just try and see why is it like that. So that defines the aim of this study that I am sharing the outcome with you today. That we went in, in the study to understand how teacher educators use technology in their in when they are teaching art and design in teacher training institutions and we used uganda as a case study and this is how we did the data collection and uh, processing i am trying to make the presentation a little bit short so that we can have more time for dialoguing because i think this is the whole interest for me to hear what you colleagues have to say about what the study found out. So please, I will try to move a little bit faster now. So this was purely a qualitative study. So we did not have any statistical data. We just based on interviews, we also were in class. For me, I was in class observing. My two other co-authors, as you read in the paper, actually my seniors were my supervisors but the data collection was purely done by me so through the interviews which were audio recorded and also non-participant observations so i sat in class to observe actually how teachers were using the technology to teach in class and this is what was found out our findings during the analysis, we based on Van Dyck's theoretical concepts. He, he developed a theory about resources and appro appropriation theory, where he's talking about issues of access, access in terms of motivation, access in terms of material, access to technologies, access in terms of skills, access in terms of usage. So we thought that was a very good model that we could use to look through the data that we had gathered. And briefly, I will take you through the findings. As you see on the left hand side, the categories are basically uh, are based on some of the concepts from the from Van Dyck's model. I will not have so much time to go into the model in detail, but later in the discussion we can discuss more about this model as well. But one of the things he talks about is access to digital technologies or access to materials of what he calls physical access. And from the data we had gathered, we found that teachers were reporting not to have sufficient and easily accessible teaching digital resources. This was almost every teacher mentioned that in these institutions that were visited. They also didn't have open access. I have to acknowledge that yes, it is true from literature and also physical, physically that there has been an improvement in terms of digital infrastructure in most parts of, 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 of Africa and, and, and the world as a whole. But we still have some of these challenges reported more especially in developing countries like Uganda. As you could see also teachers reported that no open access to internet. They did not have enough 
access to internet. We are talking about the broadband area is low, but also there is no open access. You need to have authorization for you to use the internet, for instance, in an institution. And even when you have access, the broad, uh, the, the, the bandwidth is really, really less. And also we have, I think this is also a cultural issue, which I've also read in some other papers, to do with culture, the culture or what we could call policies, which are contradictory to the use of technology. So teachers also educators reported the institutional culture or police, uh, policies. It, I remember at one of the institutions that prohibit they bring your own device from students. So the institution says no student should bring a smartphone. No student is allowed to bring a laptop. No student is allowed to do A, B, C, D. So in that case, it limits the teachers because even when a teacher educator would have say a smartphone to which most reported to use sometimes they would find it difficult when students do not have on the other side for instance some teachers reported that they would use their smartphones and computers to send emails to their students but students would not get back to them Reason being that they could not, they could only access such uh, technologies like computers in the computer labs. So that made it a little bit more complex for uh, the teachers to use. The other point is about the usage frequency. How often do the teachers use the technology in the classrooms? It is something that we also followed up. And what came out was that there was generally an occasional use or what I could call low usage because most educators reported to occasionally have used technologies. And I could also observe this in the classrooms because the what would there would be ICT rich classrooms, they would turn into teaching some sort of like theoretical concepts to do with how we can use technology uh, to make magic, rather than the practical use of the tools in delivering content and delivering content and creating content. This was not observed during the study. And of course, we know how important very many studies and also Van Dyke's is expressed on the issue of of time or uh, in terms of how often should one be using. He guides on that, which I think in a way, I find it very important because he says that precise use of time, is a, he looks at it as a more valid indicator in terms of using digital media. So this study did not measure the usage time in terms of how long or how much time the teacher educators spent using computers, but rather from the interviews and observations, it was very clear that teachers reported to occasionally use some of these technologies, as you could see also from some of the extracts that I have got uh, there. The other point is about usage diversity. This is to do with the different ways educators use or use the technologies in the classrooms. That of course are to do with what they are teaching. So the findings indicated that they indeed had this diverse use of the available technologies, the technologies that are available to them. And when I'm talking about what was available to them, this is more basically to do with the computers, basic computers, you would find, you, you saw an example before about a teacher who was reporting about how they have large classes and they have few computers, for instance. So the computers were not enough for, for, for the students. So when we are talking about diverse 
use here also we are looking at the available technologies they have because few teachers had their personal digital devices so and much as this usage was diverse but it was basic use because in art and design we use digital tools for specific reasons or for specific works for instance if you're using an uh, uh, a design program like adobe illustrator to work with vector images but we do not really look at teachers using the basic applications like microsoft word just to read students uh, to read students notes i think the usage much as it was diverse because they are using it to create content in terms of curating uh, information from the internet and putting it together in a word document for instance or using a powerpoint presentation but less of the design programs for instance was used which is which would be ideal for educators in art and design because they are training teachers who are going to teach concepts in art and design so the usage much as it was reported to be diverse it was basic involving use of basic applications like microsoft office programs rather than the specific art and design uh, or design programs the other point also is, and this is also reported in other cases, as you could see, uh, Apau also in Ghana also found a case where he noted like teachers were using technologies for just basic usage. The other point which is more important for us as designers is the issue of creativity. And also luckily, Van Dyck's theory guides on that. The issue of being creative, going beyond just using the technology to, you know, to, to deliver content, but using technology to, beyond just delivery, but also to look at the goals, to achieve specific goals in a specific subjects. And when it came to that, we also, employed Mishira and Kuyera's theory because he talks about, he developed the TPAC model which talks about technology, pedagogy, content, knowledge. That when we are teaching using technology, it is very iconic or it is important and it makes it more effective if we put into consideration issues the relationship between the technology, the pedagogy, and the content we are teaching. In this case, from the observations and interviews, teachers showed limited knowledge about how the three aspects relate with one, with one, one another. A teacher would be very good in, say, using a particular technology to deliver content, but did not have, say, a plan or could not easily explain the relationship between the technology he's using and what he's teaching and perhaps the choice of method he should be using. So in that, analyzing all this, we noted that there was limited creative use of the available technologies, which would be iconic when we are teaching with technology in the classroom. And I would like to almost come to a conclusion because as I said, I would want to leave more time for us to discuss. As I conclude, we noted from the findings that desired learning outcomes mediated through the use of technology in, in a developing country like Uganda may be greatly impeded because teachers all they are reporting we noted that they still have so many issues relating to access in terms of the technologies themselves 
but also the skills they do not possess the they would be desirable skills to use or apply the technology in the teaching of art and design but also the teachers you know they are they are, they are in a, a dilemma that's why we had this title the dilemma because it's the whole the whole event during the research and analyzing data it felt like teachers are really facing a dilemma in the process of integrating technologies in the teaching process and we are using art and design as a case but i'm very sure that that even other studies as i've read indicate somehow the same outcomes and we feel there is need to address the digital divide generally not only in uganda even in the developed world you read like much as they have more than what developing countries would have but still they are talking about the digital divide van dyke for instance who developed the resources and appropriation theory is from a country would say um is is well to do with in terms of technology integration but you know is reporting not only in the netherlands but also other countries about this issue of digital divide so there is urgent need for us to address or for institutions governments to address um this divide that is reflecting itself in terms of the lack of skills the lack of technologies and any other forms of divide that uh that, uh, sh uh, that 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 showed up the other point is also to do with the implementation that we feel like that should be the outcome of this study indicated or calls for the need to implement what we have termed as subject based curriculum maybe what i did not say before is that is how the teachers are trained i i really need to say that at this point because there is no specific subject based curriculum when i say subject based curriculum in terms of like say art and design that you have the curriculum is specific is specific on in in the terms of the technology the teachers are supposed to be using in terms of the applications in terms of the methods in terms of so it's not specific so it's just broad so when you look at how teachers are trained they end up coming up with this kind of generic skills like someone can easily talk about using computer you know to type okay microsoft word to type a document of course that is generic every person would know, would, would do that so we feel there is a need for institutions to develop subject-based curriculum but also policies because when you look at the institutional policies for instance that they are also general the institutions we visited for instance had their own ict policies but these were general touching broad things okay to do with how ICT should be used in terms of managing um, uh, results, in terms of managing uh, the finances, in terms of managing, but not specific on how teachers can use ICT in their subject areas. Because if that is done, perhaps we could have teachers improving their ability to creatively use some of these digital technologies in the teaching processes as i sum up i sum up with kind of questions to reflect because these might not be specific to this study but they bring some other issues that perhaps we need to think about as education technologists and one of the issues that I have been asking myself is how do we address the digital divide that still exists even in the 21st century all over it doesn't have to be in Uganda 
you can reflect about your own country. But the question is, how can we address this digital divide? Because as you could see from the implications, it is something we are calling for. So it would be important if we could, members could also think about that. The other point is how do we address social cultural issues when we are in the process of adopting or we adopt technology in the teaching? Because in Africa, in other words, uh, that's why I'm adding that do we need to Africa, Africanize our, uh, our technology-based teaching? Are there any possibilities? Because I, I find that in some cases, especially in Africa, in Uganda in particular, we have what we call like the social cultural issues, which actually influence or affect the integration of technology. Okay. Where the people's perceptions, and this doesn't have to do with the teacher educators or, but even the general culture, the perception, like when you use social media, you very well know, like for instance, in Uganda, we do pay what we call a social media tax. And that is that was also one of the things that that educators reported because some of them have their smartphones, but they cannot use, you know, they cannot spend all the time because you have to pay, you know, to use to use your phone. Because the culture in Uganda is that social media is not good. Okay. And government has put a ban and taxes to, to regulate the way we use social media. But when you look at emerging research in as far as technology is concerned, you find you can ask yourself if really social media is good or bad. So that's why I'm asking the question on how we can address these kind of social cultural issues when we are trying to use new or emerging technologies in our education contexts. The other point, perhaps, the last question is, I always question myself if we are just consumers of technology in Africa, in Uganda, are we just consumers of technology? Okay. Do we prepare, you know, our teacher candidates to meet the current technological needs? Because as I noted before, if we train teachers to to come out of the training institutions with generic skills. And yet in the market, we have specific demands. How do we, what do we have to say about that? I won't say that I have answers to these questions, but in the process of research and getting to know and understand the field more, these are some of the questions that I feel like members also need to reflect whether in this uh, today or another time, but it's like take home. I also want to, would like to interest you with some of the other papers that are related to this uh, presentation. Uh, so in your free time, I think the first one I have given a resource, you can read through. It is directly linked also to this presentation. And there is this which is still in place, it's not yet out. But I would want to interest you to look at these resources so that you can also understand today's uh, presentation uh, very well. Otherwise, I would want at this time to hand over to the facilitator to guide the questions and if there are any questions or contributions. Yes, I thank you for your audience. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wycliffe. And uh, it was interesting listening to your um, presentation. Um, I would like to open it up to members. If you have any questions, please um, post your questions in our text chat area and uh, Dr. Wycliffe would respond to it accordingly. So, from at the moment from the text chat area, there have been very interesting comments from members and um, some of them have been about, um, we, Brenda posted 
a feedback on the topic. She indicated that there is a need for us to look at more sustainable ways of introducing technology into our education. And she indicated that although a funded project is often a good way to initiate change and integration, but then the sustainability should be built in and committed to by a higher education institution as part of the project intentional goals. And um, Tony also said that due to some of these challenges, they even see technologies in education um, as extra work to their ever present challenges with face to face. And although technology could actually help people, they seem to see it as um, more challenging to actually access this based on some of the feedback that you raised. And this was a response from me to what um, Tony um, posted. So I would like to see if there are any more, please uh, type your comments in the text chat area. And we would like to hear what others are thinking on the topic. And then Tony says that uh, presumably part of the problem is that the technologies for consumption of content are more reliable and bandwidth conserving than the technologies for online interaction and distribution of content by local producers. So yeah, and uh, we are very pleased that you shared your resources. So anyone, um, would you like to say something, um, Tony? Would you like to say something in relation to what um, Dr. Wycliffe had said? Yeah, um, I think it was fascinating to hear about uh, this challenge contextualized, both in Uganda and in terms of art and design teaching, because this is a generic challenge, which is experienced in, I would guess, on a large scale, in almost every country across South Africa and across Africa. Um, and the con consequence of that is that you always have this tension where um, you have some teachers who are aspirant and really want to make things happen, despite the fact that the systems and infrastructure do not support what they're trying to do with technology. And others who know that there are risks, and this is difficult, so they'll, they'll hold back. Because the incentives to um, do this kind of innovation are not so great, and the risks of getting it wrong are quite high. Uh, would you like to say something about that, Wycliffe? Yeah, thank you, Tony, and of course for your tremendous feedback. Um, I think yours have been more of uh, a contribution. Uh, first, I would want to say that I am in agreement, especially where you raise the issue of technology being seen as extra work. Um, and now the recent, the recent you just raised about technology being a generic challenge and having teachers who would want to really show a difference, but they are curbed down by the, the, the existing policy infrastructure and, and uh, the other challenges. So it is true and um, was very much noted during the process of the research um, because there are really teachers who are committed and have too much experience, practical experience in terms of using technology as a pedagogical tool, but they are so much limited by the existing infrastructure, not only actually the, the physical infrastructure in terms of the available technologies, but more specifically to the infrastructure that is beyond their control, especially when it comes to issues of policy. I just gave, for instance, an example where the policy um, is, there is one, that I would want really to give as an example, where in this air and age, at one of the institutions, there was a report about teachers not being allowed to say a submit electronic um, electronic examination questions to, to the relevant departments. 
because the idea is that if you submit an electronic copy, then you could have, uh, you, you have stayed with another copy. These look like a cake, but I mean, that's the reality in some of the institutions. So it might not be, it might, it might sound weird, but I mean, how do you work even when you would want to make that change? So it's some, that's why I'm asking questions, Tony, if it would be important for us perhaps to should I say indigenize, Africanize? Is it possible? So that is how I could respond, Tony, in terms of what you have shared. And also to say thank you for your contribution. Okay, thank you so much, um, Waikri, for that lovely insight there. Um, I would also like to say a little bit on that I think most of the things you were talking about in terms of uh, our, uh, in terms of, for example, submitting, let's say, digital copies of questionnaire in, in the area of art and design. Um, for our case, for example, we have, we have a combination of the two. If we have to do um, online um, exams, that one, it's sort of set set up and then students would actually work on that in a designated um it lab so they do it in real time and write on but in most cases and majority of the questions are done with paper based then we have the studio but i think with the studio apart from the fine art and the sculpture and other physical heavy stuff students are allowed to sort of submit um, exercises in electronic formats. So that is a bit of what is happening on our side. We do more or less, let's say a combination of the two. But the general challenge comes with um, educators actually teaching um, art and design, mostly in high schools and in underserved uh, communities within our region in, in Ghana because most of them and the students are not allowed to use uh, technology in their classrooms. Students are not allowed to even take mobile phones to school. So most people in senior high schools do not use um, technology in their schools. So then if you are a teacher and you're teaching something like design with animation and all that, how then do you even do it? when students cannot use um, technology, but they normally take a course in ICT. And it's only at that time that they're allowed to access the computers and after that, it's over until you go home. But there are other reasons for them to, to introduce that. And so there's a bit of other ideas that we can, we can look at and we, we need to consider in our African settings, like the question you asked, how do we Africanize these things and make it relevant to our settings? So, yeah. So basically that is, that is a few um, ideas I, I, I can share on that point. But before I take more questions from the floor, I would like to share our short survey for today's event and we'll be grateful for people to uh, complete the surveys for us, for us to know how we fared today in our session. And then I would like to, to read a few comments also from the floor and um, Gab says that to address the digital divide that exists in our teacher training colleges, we need to address the things that are already working well and the constraints that exist in the use of edtech also need to know the extent of the divide and know what we can do immediately and in the long term to address the existing challenges. Then Brenda says that um, OER materials are already in place for use at teachers' colleges. So perhaps in this case, the internet access and infrastructure are needed as enablers. Yes, that's a very interesting point over there. And again, Brenda says that a change in mindset needed for successful implementation. Um, assessment is a difficult place to start, rather go for low hanging fruit, quick successes, yes.
Thank you so much. And uh, Gabriel, um, would you like to um, talk next, please, if you have something to say? Please feel free to contribute. Gabriel, Brenda. Okay, while we wait for Gabriel and Brenda to respond, um, Wycliffe, would you like to add a few more things to the few discussions on the floor? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. I would really want also to commend the contribution from Brenda because from the start she's been, uh, she's, she's really offered uh, quite a number of contributions because one of the things she mentioned was to do with the need to look for sustainable ways of integrating technology. And I think, um, I agree, I agree entirely with Brenda. And I think one of the issues, for instance, in Africa, Uganda in particular, we have had, because in some ways I have also been involved um, in working with some of the funding for, 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 for some of the projects where you have uh, to cooperate with other institutions, especially from what they say, the Global North, um, to set up some of these um, infrastructure, for instance, setting up labs and stuff like that. But I think in most cases, when the funding is done, we see these developments go back to the drill. So, and it's all about the issue of from the start where these sustainable solutions. So when she talked about the issue of looking for sustainable ways of integrating technology more specific to our context, I think she has a very uh, big point there. Um, and also I would want still with Brenda, the issue of internet inf infrastructure. Um, looking from, from, for instance, this research in the process of collecting data, I found quite often that teacher educators were reporting more often about the issue of them getting, curating content from the internet. They were uh, bringing issues of failing to have access to resources, uh, like tutorials from where they could learn how to use some of the technologies like the software. Because this downloading a tutorial, for instance, takes a lot of data but also at the same time, it requires a stable connection. I was telling you, Rarista, uh, today that I, I am working from home because I trust my connection at home than the institution. If I was at, at school or at campus, I'm very sure I won't even have had this. So the question of investing in internet, stable internet connectivity in this information age is very important. And um, as you say, that is what I can for now add to Brenda's voice, if maybe there are other contributions. Hello. Hello, Wycliffe, thank you very much. Um, Gabriel, would you like to speak? <laughs> and Brenda, you would like to hear your voice if it's possible? Sure, Please. I'd like to, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Brenda. I would like to hear your voice. Um, Wycliffe, I'm, I'm so impressed at the, the manner in which you undertook this research and congratulations for that. Um, I've just been sitting here thinking about sustainability. And I think that this is one of the reasons why the Emerge Africa Network is so important. And I think Tony is a prime example of somebody who has persevered over a number of years to build a network um, to, to have the that it currently has. Uh, so I'm, now I'm honing in on your own context in Uganda, 
And something that worried me when I went to a conference recently, the Commonwealth of Learning Conference in Edinburgh, there was somebody from Uganda, a well-known e-learning researcher, who gave a paper on the history of e-learning in Uganda. And they did not include a massive five-year project within which I had been involved that had continental reach, with that person's institution being one of the um, partners. So I've been thinking about this ever since, and one of the things, and I'm not sure how to do it, is even for in-country, within specific countries, to find out what's happening at other institutions within the countries and try and form a country group so that one doesn't lose this um, institutional um, uh, historical kind of um, experience. I mean, this was a loss within the same institution. They had not even thought about, well, that's where the e-learning really began at this institution. So for me, it's this institutional memory, and one can think of it as country memory as well, of saying, how can I gather my colleagues um, to, so that we can support each other? I think maybe one can do it inside Emerge, but there may be other face-to-face -face opportunities as well um, with institutional groups within one country. Thank you very much, Brenda. Hello, Brenda. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Gabby, please, would you like to speak? Are you able to speak? Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Gabriel. Nice. Loud and okay, clear. Thank you. Over thank to you, you so Gabriel. much. Uh, okay. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, uh, Wycliffe for the... Very thing of the issues I've noticed that even in my own digital divide, you know, in our country, we focus more on the institutions that seem to have internet access and are doing well, they're using technology and want to encourage them. But we maybe we feel discouraged to help those that are struggling and we feel it will take a lot of work. So we really need to have a balance and see how do we help those that are struggling and then also how do we use those that are doing well, those that are using existing technologies and able to handle the use of technologies in class well, they allow students to use them because other institutions, maybe because they don't know, they are scared for, for those in government, the, the power, they should be able to encourage this collaboration, this working together so that it's a win-win situation. It shouldn't be like more of a competitive spirit. Those that are doing well want to show that they can do far better than the others, but seeing how you can help uh, those that are struggling to get to their friends, even within a school situation, because the divide can also be in the, in the school situation. Others are able to use technologies more confidently and yet others struggle, but we should aim to bring those that are struggling to desired level and keep going at it despite the discouragements knowing that once everyone comes on board then there will be a lot of benefits so basically that's what i wanted to contribute thank you all right thank you so much um uh, mr gabriel and please uh, dr wycliffe um any last few words from you Yes, thank you, uh, facilitator. And I would like to also thank Gabriel for the contribution. And just to add to his voice that uh, I acknowledge what he puts forward. And I think it would have been unfair if he left before submitting that contribution. But luckily he has done that. 
I think the issue of collaboration is one of, in fact, in one of the papers that I have attached as a resource, which is to do with developing the competence, one of the issues that teacher educators and uh, administrators were reporting in institutions were, was that teachers are developing digital competences, the ability to use the tools collaboratively because they did not have the, the formal training they had in, a, in, in related to using the technologies was not sufficient enough was more theoretical. So through collaboration with experts and colleagues, either from other institutions or within the institution, most teachers reported to have developed competences through that. So Gabriel is right in terms of this institutional collaboration and eliminating the what he has termed as competition, which I think actually is right that institutions which are bigger want to be more big, leaving the others uh, floating. I think I agree and that we need to pull each other as brothers and sisters from the, uh, from, from the same continent so that we can all be at the same level. That said, I would want to give my last uh, word first by giving a, a vote of appreciation to all the participants. I did not know I would have people, you know, picking interest to listen to this discussion, but I thank each one of you who have attended. Thank you very much and for your contributions. You know, <laughs> It's like when you cook the food and then there is no one to eat it in Africa here, then you will have a problem. Actually, you might end up not even eating your own food. So when I prepare and then I see people coming to, to be with me, I think that's really a very big opportunity. But also to thank Image Africa, uh, Tony and the team for requesting me to share my research with you and also for giving me the opportunity to train with you. As I noted before, I have been doing an online facilitation course with Image Africa. So I think it's been also a very big opportunity for me also to look at the, this area in a more uh, broader perspective. So it's more like to appreciate everyone for the different contributions. I thank you. All right, thank you to Mr. Dr. Wycliffe, and we appreciate your contribution for today and sharing your research with us. And once again, before we go, I would like to hand over the mic to our co-hosts for everyone to say bye. And before we do that, I also like to remind everyone who participated today to complete our short survey for us on today's event after we close the session. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And I would like to hand over the mic to Tony for his last words. Tony, over to you. OK, thank you very much, Relitza. Um, I didn't expect to get the mic now. But what I really want to say is thank you so much to Wycliffe for um, coming here and sharing this lovely research and telling us about some of the specificity of the context in which access issues play out um, among design and art teachers in Uganda. And I think you have brought us very delicious and nourishing food and um, really appreciate that you have shared, shared this with us. And thank you also to the participants for your engagement, for your questions, for your insights, for really enriching the conversation. Thanks to Ralitza for hosting this conversation and convening, and to Jakob, who's been sitting in the background, who basically masterminded the organization and is also managing the technology. 
Um, the URL for the survey is in the text chat. So please complete that um, as soon as you can. Otherwise, I know you'll forget it completely. And looking forward to seeing you again at another Emerge Africa event. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of planning for some really exciting events into next year. Um, I think the only one we've got left this year is an Emerge Africa. Once we've got left our Emerge Africa Arabic events. So if you speak Arabic, um, you're in luck. Otherwise, um, we'll be making announcements about events for next year. Stay well all. Thank you.